Hey guys, this is Kremi Glacio with AC Service Tech, and today what we're going over is how to explain superheat and subcooling to your apprentice. So what you need is an evaporator coil and an outdoor condensing unit and a gauge set. I'm going to cover subcooling first, and subcooling is taken right here at the outdoor unit service valve. So it's the liquid line service valve, it's the small one. So some of the terms to remember that is that you have a red gauge, red hose, high side line, liquid, small tube. Okay, so that's how you remember that. So that's the subcooling. You're checking the subcooling right there. You're checking superheat over here. So superheat is the vapor line, and you're checking that with the blue gauge, which is the low side with the blue hose, and that is a vapor. So the vapor line is always larger than the liquid line. So you're checking total superheat out here, and you're checking subcooling right here. So what is subcooling? Subcooling is the lowering in temperature of the liquid refrigerant in the condenser coil, and we measure it where it comes out of the condenser coil over here. So inside this outdoor unit, you have a compressor, and there's low pressure vapor coming into the compressor and high pressure vapor coming out. This high pressure vapor is high temperature because of the, because of the high pressure. So what happens is the high pressure, high temperature vapor refrigerant starts traveling through this coil and this condensing unit's job is it's sucking the, the air across this coil and then blowing the hot air out the top. So what you're doing is you're ejecting heat from this high pressure vapor refrigerant. So as it's traveling through the, the tubing within this coil, it's lowering in temperature as a vapor, and then it turns into a saturated refrigerant where you have vapor and liquid both exist at the same time. Once it gets to that point where you're saturated, you're no longer lowering in temperature, you're just phase changing from a vapor to a liquid. So that would happen, say, in the center of this coil. Once it turns into a complete liquid, say right about here, then what's happening is it's then lowering in temperature as a liquid refrigerant. So when you're measuring the pressure right here, you're actually measuring the pressure in the saturated uh, state right here. So when you measure the pressure, you're gonna convert that to saturated temperature. As well, you're gonna take a temperature measurement on this liquid line, and the temperature measurement is going to be the lower temperature after the refrigerant comes out of the saturated state. I know that's hard to understand, but you are measuring the pressure in the saturated state in the outdoor condenser coil, but the temperature here is after the liquid lowers in temperature as it travels through the tubing and is rejecting heat to the outside air. So that is subcooling, the lowering in temperature of the liquid refrigerant. Now to measure subcooling, what you do is you measure the pressure. So say it's at 250 PSI. So this needle goes all the way up to say 250 and you bring the needle in to whatever refrigerant this is. So if this is an R22 unit, you can use this green pressure temperature chart that's overlaid on the gauge face. So you bring it from the pressure into the green inner ring and that's when you read your saturated temperature. If this was an r 14 i unit, you can take your, your pressure and you bring it into the pink inner ring, which is the saturated temperature at that pressure. Now, if you don't have the, the saturated temperatures overlaid on the gauge face, then you can just use a PT chart. If you have a digital gauge set, it'll calculate it automatically. You just need to take your pressure reading and it will convert it to saturated temperature. Then you just take a digital temperature reading on the outside of this tube right here, this liquid tube. So the temperature on this liquid tube will be lower then the saturated temperature that you've, you've converted the pressure to. As an example, if this unit was R4 tonight and it said R4 tonight on the outdoor unit rating plate, and you measured a pressure on your liquid line of say 300 while the system was running, and you brought that into a pink temperature of 94 degrees, that would mean that the pressure converted the temperature of the saturated refrigerant is 94 degrees. Then you take an actual temperature measurement right here on the liquid line within a few inches of the port. If you measured 84 degrees on the line right here, that would mean that you have 94 degrees saturated temperature minus 84 degree actual line temperature. That's 10 degrees of subcooling. We use a subcooling measurement in order to check the refrigerant charge level of an air conditioning system that has a thermostatic expansion valve. So this is otherwise known as a TEV or TXV and it's a regulating metering device. It's actually able to open up the hole and close down the hole in order to regulate the refrigerant that's entering into this evaporator coil. A dead giveaway that you have a TXV is a bulb like this or your external equalization line. So if these are mounted outside of the coil, then you'll know that you have a thermostatic expansion valve 
Otherwise, you may have to take this cover off in order to determine what type of metering device you have. If you have a thermostatic expansion valve, you want to get the subcoin measurement as close as possible to the target subcoin rating on the rating plate. So if there is no target subcoin rating out here, it may be on the underside of the shroud. So you may have to take the shroud off and look on the underside in order to determine what that target subcoin should be. If you measure a higher subcoin than you have on the target subcoin, then that means you're overcharged. If you have less subcoin than on here, then you're undercharged. So if you had a target subcoin of 14 degrees and we measured 10 degrees, then we would want to add refrigerant to this system in order to increase the subcoin. Now, if you didn't have a thermostatic expansion valve, but you did have something that looked like this, this is a fixed orifice metering device. It's known as a capillary tube. And these are also fixed orifices as well. So these are piston chambers. And inside, there is just a, a fixed hole right, on the, right in the center here where the refrigerant travels through. If you have a fixed orifice as the metering device at the evaporator coil, then you need to check the refrigerant charge with the total superheat method when you're measuring the pressure on the large vapor line and taking an actual temperature reading on the line within a few inches of that port. An example of measuring total superheat would be if you took a pressure reading on the large vapor line while the system was running and you measured about 120 PSIG on the outer ring. If you brought that into the R4 tonight saturated temperature and you converted that pressure, it would be 41 degrees saturated temperature in the middle of the evaporator coil. So then you take in temperature reading with a digital temp meter on the large vapor line within a few inches of this port. So if this temperature reading was, say, 54 degrees, you take 54 degrees minus the saturated temperature of 41 degrees, and you get 13 degrees of total superheat measured. There is no rating on the outdoor unit rating plate or the indoor unit rating plate that tells you what the target superheat should be. You should not set it at a certain pressure. What you need to do is you need to take an indoor wet bulb reading within the building. So at the return, you need to take a wet bulb reading with a digital psychrometer, and then you take an outdoor temperature reading right near the outdoor condensing unit, and you just take it out of the sun, and you don't get it near the, the hot air coming out. You put those two measurements on a superheat chart, and you can determine what the target superheat needs to be. You can also use a, a target superheat app you could also use, if you have a digital manifold, you might be able to enter the, the wet bulb temperature inside the building and the outdoor dry bulb temperature outside, and, and that may be able to come up with a target superheat for you. We go into great detail with the target superheat in our book and also where to take your measurements at, your indoor wet bulb, and also your outdoor dry bulb. So here's our book, and we also have these quick reference cards that walk you through checking the charge with superheat and with subcooling. So also measuring delta T, and the other cards have a PT chart and also refrigerant weights, a troubleshooting guide, and also when you walk up on a frozen evaporator coil, what the steps are in order to determine what the problem is. So just remember that target superheat with a system that has a fixed orifice is a moving number. So just because you get a measurement of, say, 13 degrees of total superheat, it doesn't mean that that's what the correct number should be. If you measure a total superheat of 13 degrees, and your target was 17 degrees, and that means that you're overcharged. But if your target superheat was, say, 9 degrees, and you measured 13 degrees, then that means you're undercharged. I want to get back to what superheat actually is, and superheat occurs at the indoor evaporator coil, subcooling occurs at the outdoor condenser coil. But you have high pressure, high temperature, subcooled liquid refrigerant travels from the outdoor unit to the indoor coil on the small liquid line, so it enters the TXV as a high pressure, high temperature, subcooled liquid refrigerant. It then lowers the pressure at the metering device. And when you lower pressure, you lower temperature. But what's happening is it travels through, the refrigerant travels through the distributor tubes to the evaporator coil, and it immediately changes to a 80% liquid, 20% flash gas. So it's already in the saturated state when it enters the coil. Then the refrigerant's absorbing heat from the air crossing the coil. And so it's not going to increase in temperature as it's absorbing the heat. It's just going to phase change. So by the time it gets up to about here, you're looking at a 50-50 mixture, 50% liquid, 50% gas. By the time it gets up to here, you're looking at maybe 80% vapor, 20% liquid. Then it's getting up to about here, and it's totally in the gaseous state, the vapor state, 
and then it can increase in temperature. So the refrigerant is totally in vapor form at this point, and then the increase in temperature as it's traveling through the tubes is called the superheat. So between here and where it comes out of the evaporator coil right here is called the superheat, and where the, the vapor refrigerant travels to the outdoor unit, that's called the total superheat by the time it gets out here. I know it's hard to believe, but we're measuring the pressure here to, in order to measure the pressure of the saturated state in the middle of this evaporator coil. We're doing that to convert it to saturated temperature. So that's the only reason we're measuring pressure right here is to get a saturated temperature. So if we know the saturated temperature right here on this coil, when the temperature increases, finally once it gets into the vapor state and it's increasing in temperature as, it, as it's absorbing heat, the temperature measurement here is going to be higher than the saturated temperature measurement here. And so in our case, we use the example of 13 degrees uh, increase of temperature. So if this evaporator coil was running at a saturated temperature of 41 degrees, but by the time the refrigerant came out on this vapor line, it was 54 degrees, and that would mean it's 13 degrees of superheat. And we're measuring over here, which is the total superheat. So we're picking up or reducing any temperature of the vapor refrigerant by the time it gets all the way out here. So it should be very close. Our total superheat and our and our superheat should be very close within a maybe a degree or so, unless these the vapor line is buried in the ground or something like that on the way to the outdoor unit. So the beauty of the thermostatic expansion valve is it's going to be able to hold the superheat at a steady amount because it's measuring the temperature on the vapor line and the pressure on the vapor line. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing over here. We're measuring the pressure and the temperature. There's other components in the TXV such as the spring pressure, but the whole point is that it's monitoring the superheat and it's adjusting the refrigerant flow to try to hold the superheat steady regardless of the heat load of the air coming across this evaporator coil. So the whole point, the whole reason that we don't check our total superheat to check the refrigerant charge of a system that has a thermostatic expansion valve is because this TXV is going to try to hold the superheat steady all the time as long as it has the correct amount of refrigerant entering the TXV. So that's why when a system has a TXV we measure the subcooling and that's going to tell us the refrigerant charge level. If we don't have something that's like this, the TXV, that's able to hold the superheat steady, then the superheat is going to fluctuate because you're only letting in the same amount of refrigerant all the time into this evaporator coil. So that's why we have to measure the superheat, the total superheat, with our blue gauge on our vapor line in order to check the refrigerant charge of a system that has a fixed orifice. I know that's a lot of information, but that's what's actually happening in this system. So we got to know what total superheat and the subcooling are in order to check the refrigerant charge and also to be able to quickly troubleshoot a unit if it's not working properly. We go into all the details in our book, the refrigerant charging and service procedures for air conditioning. I made sure that we had a large font size. We've got pictures in order to determine uh, what the problems are. We have different scenarios, the preparing a system for refrigerant with a vacuum and the recovery procedures, all that type of stuff is in this book right here. We also have a workbook for our book, and this contains 1,000 questions that I specifically want you to know so that you're an effective technician out there in the field. And we're also providing our answer key, and so we have the color images right here as well as all of our A, B, C, D, true and false questions. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of application questions and preparation of a system for refrigerant, checking the charge, troubleshooting, and also airflow. So we have that available as well. So check this stuff out over at Amazon or over at our website at acservicetech.com. At our website, we have a full outline of everything that's contained in this book. Hope you enjoyed yourself, and we'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.